And when it comes to explaining this, you know, a lot of times we have to say it in, in ways that people can fully understand. Right. That's why we we as urban apologists, we, we contextualize the gospel. Depending on the crowd that we're speaking to, we have to, you know, customize the message to that particular audience. We don't water down the message. We don't change the message, but we present it in a manner that people can can truly accept. And um, I think one of the people that that do a really good job with that is um, our good brother, Mr. Phil Fox. And he would like to, at this point, contextualize the gospel in a very specific way. So, Mr. Phil Fox, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, D. New, for that. Um, uh, our heart breaks with this, with with that, with that understanding. And the thing that came to mind to me and the thing that breaks my heart the most was when I read passages like Isaiah uh, 53, 7, uh, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like the sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. So, <clears throat> there's a story that I read. Um, it's retold by Joseph Marshall the th the third in his book The Lakota Way: uh, Stories of uh, Stories and Lessons for Living. Um, <clears throat> and actually, this was the first story that I ever told my my wife or read to her. And he opens up his book with this chapter called Humility. And it starts with the story of no moccasins. And it, it goes like this. It says, among us, the old ones are the best models of how we should live our lives. Every old person is a collection of stories because, because of all that one has lived and all that has happened in, in their world and in their lifetime. I've not met an old person yet who is... A strong who is not a strong exemplar of at least one virtue and many are outstanding exemplars of, of more than one such person was a woman named no moccasins she lived in a time before the coming of the horses prior to 1700 no moccasins and her husband three horned had have ling lived long lives and they had a son and a daughter and several grandchildren no moccasins, in fact, was a grandmother to all the children in the village. She was a small, a small woman, and by her 67th winter, her hair had the, the color of new fallen snow. The lines of her face seemed to show the many trails that she had walked throughout her life, and no visitor to her very modest home and order, but yet orderly lodged ever left hungry, and rarely without a gift in hand. Something that was finely quilled. She was more known, uh, more known far and wide for her intri her intricate uh, quilling patterns and designs, and many women came to learn her skill. But in spite of all that, she was known mainly as the wife of Three Horns. Three Horns was a man of excellent reputation. He had been a warrior far past the time when most men had lost the strength of arm and leg, as well as the will to take risks. So in his lifetime, he had collected many, many war honors. The lance of his, the lance to which his eagle feathers were tied was twice as long as a man was tall. Every feather was an honor, of course, and no other man could boast of such a thing. When he finally turned, fr turned from the war path, he took his place in the council of elders. There he offered his wisdom unselfishly, and, and the skill with which he spoke could not be matched. He was seventy winters old, but he appeared, his appearance could take your breath away. He didn't have a big belly like many, many old men did. He stood straight up and tall. His hair, which hung to his waist, was silvery white. In the village, everyone turned to Three Horns for advice. It seemed although he had always been there. So when, it, when he fell ill to, and took to his deathbed, the entire village was in disbelief. Word traveled fast and, and to so many, 
and many people came to their village to pay honor to the dying leader. Three Horns tiny village grew to twice its size in the matter of days. No moccasins, her daughter, and several other women were keep it, were were kept busy by cooking and feeding all the guests. When Three Horns was told about all the people who had come, he asked the oldest people to gather in his in his lodge. Four men and two women came to No Moccasins and Three Horns Lodge and saw a man, the man's half of the lodge, which was in the north. The long eagle staff, bows, arrows, and lances, buffalo hide shields, and were colorful symbols of the glorious life of the warrior. Three Horns was weak and ill, and he spoke in a low voice with No Moccasin sitting beside him. But he seemed to grow stronger and it went and it went on. No moccasins, as she has always done, saw the saw the comfort of her guest and as her husband told the stories and remained respectfully quiet. My friends and my friends and relatives, he began, thank you for coming to our lodge. I've been honored to share this lodge with my wife for nearly fifty winters, and in that time we have we have been given a fine son and a fine daughter and many grandchildren. Our people saw diffic difficulty as well as good. We took to the path of war now and then. Men were hurt. Some died. We are fe feared and respected among our enemies. The number of our lodges in, in the village have grown over time. We are a strong people. Our ways are good. And I am thankful for the great mystery for bringing me into this world as a Lakota. I have lived a good life. I am ready for the next. Before I leave, I have to tell a story. And I ask that after the sun comes up tomorrow that you tell this same, same story to the people that have gathered here. This is why I've asked you to come today. Here's what I want you to know. When I was a young man, I traveled south from my mother and father's village to hunt. I came to a village that was encamped for the summer, just north of the running water river. There was a great feast and a dance at that time, and there had been a fight and a great victory over the enemies of the South. I was invited to join the celebration. It was a good time. There was much food, and we danced far into the night. I awoke the next morning beside a trail uh, to the water, and it looked into the largest and most uh, trail in the water and and looked into the most wonderful eyes that I've ever seen. A young woman was gazing down at me and she said, it's funny what suddenly grows besides the trail. I jumped to my feet and I followed her to the water and carried the water skins back to the village for her. That was the best chore I've ever done in my life. The next evening I stood in line outside of the lodge of the young woman with the other young men that had come to her to court her. Her name was Carrie's the Fire. She did put the fire in my heart. I was very surprised when she asked me to come come in for the next evening. And you you will be you will not be surprised when I tell you that I remained in the village until the autumn hunts. By then, for reasons I I cannot still understand, for which I am grateful, she decided that I might be a good husband. So I went back north to tell my family so they could prepare the gifts for her family for the bride price. We were married to the following spring in between the longest winter of my life. So I left my family and become part of, part of her village as it is custom among us. Not long after that em enemies came along from the South on a revenge raid for the defeat they had suffered before. They killed a man and took two young women. A war party went south on the trail. I went along. We trailed them for half a moon, it seemed, going far into the country I've never seen. We traveled fast and caught up with them as they rejoiced, as they rejoined their village. We hid and watched, and we saw where they had put the two young women. Later, we saw their, their night sentinels were or where we saw we saw where their night their night sentinels were and we made a plan six of us that night would set a fire to
to the east of the village, and two of us would do the same on the west. While the men were putting, of, of, while the men of the village were putting, the busy putting out the fires, the two of us would sneak in, and take back the young women. The plan worked, except one thing. I was one one of the two who had who had snuck in the village, and I was captured. By dawn, our our war party had escaped back to the north with the two young women. And I was glad to pay the price of a good raid. As you might think, my captors were very angry. They made me a slave. All my clothing was taken from me, everything. I was led around naked. Everyone laughed. I was made to work. I pulled drag pulls like a dog until my hands and knees were bleeding. They teased me. They threw dirt in my face. Women pulled up their dresses in front of me and laughed, showing me that I was not no longer a man. They gave me food so that I had, I had to fight for the dogs, fight with the dogs for scraps. At night, they bounded me in my f- hand and foot and stretched me between out two stout poles. That was no, no way that there was no way to escape. I began to feel lower than a dung beetle. I lost count of the days. I looked for ways to escape, but lacking, lacked any food. The, the lack of food made me, made me very weak. And I knew that before that I was too weak, I would have to escape. After a time, they stopped putting the guard, the guard to sit with me at night. And after, uh, night after night, I would pull the poles which held me. And little by little, I loosened them. But someone had saw what I'd done, and they pounded the poles deeper, so I was discouraged. I'm not ashamed to tell you that one night I prayed to the great mystery to give me a quick death. I could not escape. I was too weak. And one night it was cold and rainy and I was naked and shivering. And there was, there was no one about. It was cold. Even the dogs were curled up out of the rain. And my heart was sad and I thought about my young wife and that I would never ever see her again. I thought about her face so much that it appeared to me. And after a moment, I realized that it was real. She was there. I lay there in disbelief. She cut my bounds with her knife. She pulled, she pulled me away and pulled it away from my feet and guarded me, guided me out of the, the enemy's village. I was weak from hunger and my mind was not clear. But I know we walked through the night and by the dawn we arrived in the hiding place that she had prepared. The rain fallen through the night and washed out our tracks. She could not have found a better time to come. She had hidden food, weapons, and my mind was clear. And I saw she was wearing men's clothes, mine, to disguise herself for the journey. We hid and ate and rested, and she gave me food And she told me that other men had returned home with the good news or with the news that I've been killed. She grieved for a time, she said, but she found herself not believing that I was really dead. One night she made preparations and left the camp. The others had told her where the, where the enemy camp was located. She knew where to look. And after many days of hiding and watching, she came to the camp on that rainy night. Though our tracks were washed away or washed out by rain, the enemy knew we had to travel north. So they sent a war party. After a few days of resting and hiding, we were eager eager to start home. We knew to be cautious, of course, and we looked often at our back trail. And that is how, that is how we saw others heading in the same direction. Six of them moving fast. I knew that I had, it had to be from the village where I've been captive and that six, six men were the best of their warriors. I had to escape. I had escaped and they were certain when they were certain I could not, they could not know that I had help because my escape was an insult and they could not let it pass. So they sent their best trackers, their fiercest warriors. They covered our tra- we covered our trails as best I could as best we could, and we could 
we could not do it any better. They were running and I could not. Carries the fire and I decided that we should hide so we would not leave a trail that they could find. But they had to be thrown off somehow. Though I thought about I thought about that, but I could do nothing. So I did not speak that thought to her. And she began to she had thought the same. So we made a good hiding place in a in a old bear's den. And after a while I sla- I slip while I slept, she slipped away. She returned that evening wet and barefoot. She had placed her moccasins near the creek and they lay a false trail of our pursuers. Later she told me that they nearly spotted her and she had to she hid in the beaver's lodge. She had to go in the creek and come up inside the beaver's house. I teased her and saying that her new name is No Moccasins. After two days, we left hiding and stuck out west, traveled in the direction for for three days, then north, and I began to call her No Moccasins. It was a name of honor for what she had done. That is why my wife is now called No Moccasins. Though I grew stronger each day, I was, it was not an easy journey home. We had to watch for enemies, find food and shelter each night, but it was her quiet courage more than anything that was our greatest strength. The people were surprised to see us and they, beloved, they, they believed that I had been killed and that my wife had gone on to kill herself. That it was not... That... Uh, that is not un unknown. My wife did what did not want me to tell this story of how we escaped our captors. The people honored me for that, but it was not my victory. I have asked the old ones in our to come to our lodge to witness for me. It is time to repay the great debt I owe my wife. Throughout my life, I was fortunate as a warrior and somehow was able to win some honors and gain reputation. Yet all those honors are not mine because I could not have achieved them. For if my wife had not risked her life, I have not heard any man in my lifetime who has done a braver deed. She traveled alone into enemy territory. She snuck into an enemy village. Few men can say they've done that. Because her deed, because of her deed, I took to the warpath each time with one thought in mind, to be worthy of my wife. For my, for, my long li- my, for my long life, I tried to be worthy, but I am afraid I am not. So I must give all these honors to the one who truly deserves them. I give them to my wife. I ask that my warrior weapons and my eagle feather staff be moved from the man's place in our lodge to the woman's place. There they rightfully should be. I will leave this, I will leave this world soon, and I ask again that another thing be done. I ask that my, bur- my burial scaffold only hold my body wrapped in my burial robe. I will leave this world as a man, as the man I was before I met my wife, poor and unadorned. All that I, I appeared would not to be if it were not for this woman. Three horns sighed deeply and settled back. No moccasin silently wiped away her tears and pulled a robe over her husband. I have known good people in my life, Three Horns continued. Many were wise, honorable, generous, and brave. But none except this old woman who sits beside me as always had the strength to give that gives true meaning to all others humility she did a brave thing and no one not the strongest warrior among us has yet to do the same yet she cared she cared not if anyone ever knew it was it is time that everyone knows thus i have spoken the old ones who gathered with three horns gave word to tell the story of No Moccasin's courage and humility. Through the days and nights followed, the young and old alike 
crowded around the campfires to listen to the old ones. Before long, no moccasin's name rose among the smoke of the campfires. Days later, three horns had died in the arms of his beloved no moccasins. Though her loss was great, she comforted others. As he wished, Three Horns' burial scaffold was adorned, was unadorned. Those who mourned for him also honored his widow. No moccasins cut her hair short in, the mor- in mourning, but nothing else outwardly changed. She lived her life the same way as always, a small, quiet old woman amidst the bustle of a busy village. She gave her husband's eagle feather staff and his shield and his weapons to the Kit Fox Warrior Society. They in turn dedicated, decided to hang those symbols of honor in the great council lodge in the center of the village. There they would remain as a reminder of one man's courage in an old woman's humility. The honor and reverence that Three Horns was given in his life now belonged to no moccasins. Not a day went by that a gift of food was left outside of her lodge door, and every day she shared those gifts with the very young and the old and the very old. For the rest of her days, no moccasins wandered for nothing. Her winter fire piled outside her door was was nearly as high as the lodge. This too she shared. She welcomed all who come to visit, and many, many of who, who did were warriors from near and far. They came to bring gifts and to share a meal and to sit in the presence of courage to learn humility. No moccasins died in her 70th winter. On her, sca- on her burial scaffold hung her husband's shield, his weapons, and his eagle's feather staff. And on the ground below piled hundreds of moccasins so she would not have to journey to the other side with bare feet. That's the story of no moccasins. Philippians chapter 2 says this, Have this in mind, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus that who was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that story. That was Amen, bro. <clears throat> that's a movie right there, man. <laughs> that's a whole movie, man. That's crazy. Action, romance, humor, that's everything. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church that he gave himself for her. And that's all I'm going to (laughs) say.